All right, and we are live now for a new episode of the Future Proof You podcast with uh, Jacob Rigg. So Jacob hello, hello. is a master. Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> so quick intro before uh, before you, you introduce yourself. Uh, Jacob is a mastermind and business coach um, who is um, helping you know building his next level business coaching in our with his family, his wife, Hina, his kids and grandchildren. <laughs> I want to hear more about this. Hi, um, Jacob, do you want to tell us more about um, you and your family to begin with? Yeah, thank you for having me, number one. And hello, everybody. Um, so I've been married now, it'll be 29 years uh, this year. And I was an instant dad um, way back when. I helped raise two daughters and I'm fortunate enough to um, have learned from a really good stepfather myself who uh, my father passed away when I was five and I always said, and I got to tell him before he passed it, my, my father picked this person out because he taught me how to be a compassionate man. But he also mm. showed me by example how to be a good stepfather. So I raised two girls and I have two grandchildren who are here today and they're like, when are you getting done? Because <laughs> they, <laughs> they want to play. Um, so they're five and three right now and they're just like, you know, raising children is um, one of the best gifts I've ever been given, especially mm. being a stepfather and having the relationship that I have. But being a grandfather is like, uh, I hope you get the experience, uh, Julie. <laughs> it's, it, it's just amazing. And uh, yeah, I, you know, I was a, I'm a late learner in life and it took me longer than required to realize uh, the value of family and how important a role mm. that we play in it. Um, you know, and if we only get one message out today, I'll just share it really quick, which is yeah, uh, don't take it for granted. Um, slow down. It's not all about success and career. It's, it's about doing that, but it's also about not missing and enjoying every single moment and do it if you can. I like that. Just writing it down. Good. All right, so um, tell us, how did you get started uh, on your entrepreneurial journey? What what made you move from corporate to your first business, and was it linked to to you have, uh, becoming a stepfather? What was the, what was the balance in there? Yeah, well, uh, in the short answer, it was partial insanity. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> but I had a really good corporate uh, gig. I was in corporate sales. I sold Yellow Page or directional advertising. I made a lot of money doing it, and I figured out how to work five to six hours a day and and make it work. And uh, mm. so, but uh, my my real father was an entrepreneur. Um, my family on his side were entrepreneurs. I think it was just in my blood. I just had this thing where corporate life wasn't my thing. They kept me because I was good, not because I was a corporate uh, poster kid. And they would beg me, you won this award, please come to this uh, award ceremony. And I go, I didn't come to be in ceremonies. I came to help my people and make as much money as I could. And so, I, I, like I said, I wasn't the epitome of a, of a perfect corporate person, but they kept me because I had good results. Mm -hmm. um, and I just decided at one point that it was time and uh, one of my customers introduced me to a product and service that was kind of new. Um, and it just made sense. And I had no experience in it at all, but I knew how to sell. And I knew how to make a commitment full out. And I, I knew that I could figure out the rest. And uh, so I, <laughs> okay. I went into it blindly. I really did. I, I, I went from selling paper hands, you know, never touching. My tools were a, a butter knife for a screwdriver and you know, anything hard for a hammer. <laughs> so, um, and I started uh, installing bathtub liners and wall systems and bathroom remodeling. And uh, yeah. in my first 10 months, we had just meteoric success. I knew I was creating a sales company. I wasn't creating a business that I, I or I wasn't creating a business that did bathrooms. What I was creating was a sales company that happened to do bathrooms. Yes. So, so sales and marketing were my main focus right from the start. And it, it proved a good recipe. Um, so my first year in business, we did 
uh, 1.2 million in our first 10 months in business. Oh, so it's meteoric that's success. That's not bad for, <laughs> that's not bad, yeah. That's yeah, a, it was a good awesome. year. And what was the impact on, 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 the, on the life at, at home? Because that, you know, you were saying you were working five to six hours in a corporate job. What happened when you actually, you know, you had to get to sell through and then actually do the delivery as well? Yeah, well, it, you know, it went from five to six hours to like 50 to 60 hours a day. <clears throat> Excuse me. It felt, felt like a day. Um, but it was, you know, I went from 25 yeah, yeah. to 30 hours a week to 50 to 70 a week. Um, and you just live and breathe yeah. it, as you know. And you t and I started from my home. Um, and within a few weeks, I had sold so many jobs that uh, I went, my, <clears throat> the whole journey was I took a two week vacation from my corporate job to start this business. And I ran a bunch okay. of advertising and it worked. Um, okay. <laughs> and I, I sold, I sold 11 jobs in two days and I realized my Nine. three and a half, my three and a half stall garage, you know, where I housed my car at my home wasn't going to work. Uh, and I just made a full commitment. I signed a three year lease for a 7,000 square foot building, um, and people thought I was crazy, but I, I had a vision. I saw it full and I, I didn't okay. know better at the time cause it was new. Um, but that's how it started. And, um, it was a journey, you know, the success, uh, meteoric success is a journey, but it was also a, a really big growth period that had a lot of bumps as well. And what was the impact on, on the family? Like, were you able to be as present with, with the kids, with, with, with the daughters? Uh, well, fortunately, at that time, they were teenagers. And uh, you'll experience this. <laughs> that you're, you're not the top dog anymore. Um, <laughs> when they get to be teenagers, their friends are. And so it was at a good time for me to do that. And that's part of the reason that I did it. It was, it was good timing because when they were younger, I was fully involved. They were two girls. Um, they didn't really play a lot of sports, but they were cheerleaders. And I was at every game and uh, just, you know, taking them to meetings and doing my part or my role by choice as a, as much of an active father as their father was not, which he was very active. So we just split it. Um, so it was just a good timing for the family, but it definitely put a crimp on social activity personally and social activity with the family it was an adjustment so how did you how did you how did you make that adjustment um well part of it was it was unexpected i didn't expect to sell as much as i did um so you just kind of adjust to what shows up uh luckily for me i had a strategy that, that i was in a I created a sales and a marketing and sales company. So I was anticipating a lot of activity. I had good sales skills. Um, so I was able to fill that role very quickly. And with my family, it was just a matter of, you know, I had a discussion with my wife. She was fully supportive, um, which is really important. Have the discussions be open on the conversation. Uh, and my, my kids were at a stage where, you know, they, they want you around. They just don't want to see you very much um, because they're teenagers. And, you know, that's just the way that it was with me. So it, it worked out really. It was a very easy transition because of the, the role that my wife plays with me and the relationship we have. I love that. I, I really love that. And so you, then you moved on from that brick and mortar business to your current business. So how did that happen? What was the, de the decision? And uh, again, what was the impact on the, on the family? Yeah. So, you know, you follow, uh, you'll follow calls, hopefully, and calls come to you through thoughts or ideas. Uh, and an idea is a thought as well. But I kept having this um, idea and interest in uh, getting involved in health and wellness and things of that nature. So I, I went to a seminar and I saw John Gray who wrote Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus speak. Okay. And something told me to talk to him at the end. He was the guest speaker and he was speaking to everybody. And there was like a thousand people at this event. And there were probably 200 people in a line to speak with him. And so something told me, stay and speak with him. 
So I did, and then I was in line and something said, and I just followed it this time, normally I might not have. It said, be the last person to talk to him. So I stepped, okay. out, of, I stepped out of the line and it was like two and a half hours, three hours later, I was the last person and we talked and he ended up talking to me for about 30 minutes. And he said, I have a health and wellness ranch up in Northern California. You should, you could be my guest. <laughs> I'm in, you know, so <laughs> that started the coaching journey. I worked, I ended up working with him as a volunteer at this place for seven years. I'd, I'd go and work wow. 10, 10 days a month, just volunteer. We ended up doing some business together. Um, it was just a magical experience, but he kept saying after about a year of doing this, you should be a coach. You should be a coach. You're really good at business. Cause I would, he'd ask me business questions. I'd answer. And I'm like, what's a coach? Because this was yeah. in 2000, yeah. right, which coaching wasn't very popular at all. It was around, but it wasn't very popular. He said, well, I, one of my companies um, is a coaching company. Uh, I will gift you the certification if you, take, if you do the work. So I became a certified Mars Venus business relationship coach. So I started working with people that were partners in business together. Um, and that's a fine line. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It's a fine line between coach and yeah. marriage counselor. <laughs> <laughs> Very specific target market. Yeah. Well, it wasn't, uh, you know, I didn't follow that calling. I followed the money and it didn't work. Because yeah. uh, the guy that was the main instructor, he said, go for the money. Attorneys, they, they make a lot of money. You should work with attorneys. And we were just, it was like oil and water. We just weren't a good mix. And after a few months, uh, I switched and I started working with um, healers and practitioners because that was who okay. I was exposed to at John Gray's ranch. And they all could use the help, but they didn't have the money. Um, yes. And so, you know, as in my entrepreneurial life, this was the one thing that I felt was really strong calling. So I stuck with it even when it didn't work. And I just kept doing it and kept doing it. And I had to go back to work twice to work for a small period of time to make money and then go back at coaching again. And it took about three, three and a half years for it to finally work. But when I got really firm in deciding on who I was going to work with instead yes. of trying to work with people for the money and working to help them and figuring out how I helped them the most, that's when it worked. In, within 30 days, my business turned around and I finally was able to afford um, life as a coach. I like that. I like that. All right. So now I'd like to talk about um, the structure of your business. And so by looking at it, um, helping the rest of the audience to think about their own structure, and we'll be using your example um, to walk through like the typical gap and the typical um, obstacle that we go through. Can I, um, so we'll do a little break in, in the recording of the podcast, but can I ask you to join, um, we're going to start drawing that business model on, on the platform in a screen share. Okay. I'll send you a, a link. Do I have it here? No, not that one. And if you can just create an account quickly. Okay. And then uh, that we will be able to, to work on it. Um, and let me know where we're on break. I'll, I'll, I'll keep the live on. Um, do you see the link in the comment? Um, not yet. Let me go to in the private chat. Would that be it? Yes. Yeah. Private chat. Yes. Um, not yet. Let me send you something. Uh, yeah, you're right. I didn't put it in a private chat. <laughs> All right, so I let you click on it, and um, it's you, you. You just sign up with your your name and your email address, and uh, put the name of your business, and then we'll open it the screen. And for everyone else, uh, I'm inviting uh, Jakob to create um, uh, his his business canvas on a on a on, on a lean canvas. And um, in a previous episode, we went through um, through this methodology with um, with Ash Maria, who came up with um, with a lean canvas. And um, it's gonna. I like when um, the entrepreneur himself is driving the business model because 
he's in charge and he's going to be able to tell to show us where things went well and where they didn't go well and how, how he fixed them and how he recommends um on fixing them we'll see those nine boxes um that we we talked about before which is um, customers um who do we target what are their what are their problems uh, what is our value proposition? What is the solution that we can bring to to these customers? Um, has the channels to reach out to them? And then um, finally, the metric that we follow and uh, cost and, and revenue. How are you doing, Jacob? I'm good. I'm, I think I'm in. Now, what do I do now? Okay. So, um, do you want to? Uh, are you signed up? Uh, can you share your screen? I don't want to show uh, you. Yeah. Let me see if I can share my screen. Cool. Excellent. Can you see my screen yet? Not yet. Yes. Okay, cool. Add to the stream. Yes, we can see it. Excellent. All right, so go on the top right corner, like it says, uh, my first Canva in pink. Sorry, uh, scroll down. Uh, sorry, down now. Oh, Under sorry. business. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Lean Canvas. Click on it. Perfect. Uh, let's rename it to the name of your business. Um, where's my name? Instead of my first, uh, my first Canva. Oh, okay, got it. And put the name of your current business. Cool. And if you want to maximize your, your window, so this way we can see it better. Mindset and... Left inside, yeah. Sorry, I had to force Jacob to go on Chrome. <laughs> no, yeah, he's no, no longer. <laughs> so is it here? Click on the green button just above, just to maximize the window. Yeah, this one, yeah. Perfect. I got it, sorry. Yay. All right, so let's start with the beginning. Let's talk about um, your customer segment on the right inside, right? Um, how did you find, because you were telling us, you know, it, it took you three, three and a half years to go into that journey until you knew who you wanted to, who you wanted to coach and how did that come out and who are they now? Who are those, what is that? Who are those customers that, that, that now you work with? Yeah. Well, in the beginning, you know, it was the, the theory that the less that I chose, it limited my choices. And, and in reality, as we know, as we go along that the, the narrower your choice or your niche, the easier it is to find them. And so it took me a while to really um, fully understand that on a deep level. And so, oops, ah. <laughs> so what, what happens uh, or now who I focus on are uh, service-based entrepreneurs, they've been in business two to 15 years. Uh, they, yep. They're generally 35 to 55 years old. Um, do, you, do you want to write that down super quickly? Sure, where at? In, in the customer segment box on the right-hand side. Right-hand side, customer segments. Okay. Yeah. So... Right. With your hand, yeah. Service-based entrepreneurs, they are in business two to 15 years on average. Mm -hmm. uh, they are 35 to 55 years of age. Um, they uh, generate um, 300K to 1.2 million on average. Um, so what I, what, I, what I love here is how did you get to like to be so pre precise like what why are they in business from uh, two to 15 years because uh, in my mind I would have said oh well you know if they're early stage I'll be you know the first five years so why do why going through 15 years um, it it kind of played itself out I was very near I was much narrower two to five years in the beginning and then I went two to seven um, but the sweet spot, if I had to pick a sweet spot, I would say it's about seven years in business. But I have, it, that's why I picked two to 15 because I have an equal amount of, of either side of that coin. So I wouldn't go 
further than that. I've coached yes. people that have been in business for 25, 30 years, and yep. I've coached startup companies, as we had talked about before the call. Um, that's where I got to that number. Uh, my, so, if I'm coaching I like that you. You picked the you picked the niche, right? And you yeah. said that was very important to pick the niche, uh, but you you then you still um, refine that niche, right? Yes, yeah, and I, and I'm still at this point open to refining as yes. I keep growing and going along. Like every year, at least once a year, I go through my customer profile. Nice, and, and I yes. match it up to what I actually have. Um, yes. What I have found too, Julian, is that the majority of what shows up is unplanned. I, I planned, I thought I was going to coach mostly men, my yes. age group, just yeah. coming out of corporate, going into a, just what I did. And yeah. within the first year, I realized, and, and so I've been at this now 12 years full time. Um, yes. It's still, 68% female entrepreneurs. That is that is 32% interesting. male entrepreneurs. I don't I don't focus yeah. my marketing on female entrepreneurs. Yeah, yeah, my yeah. my voice, my way, whatever it is, that seems who says yes more often than not. And I can't I can't pinpoint it, but I'm not arguing with it either or resisting it, you know. Cool. Now that I, I like it. I like what you're saying. Like you revisit who you had and look at your plan. So I'm just adding this into your uh, into your customer segment that, that defined them. Um, it's so important that we review that that you review it and look at what's actually happening in in in, um, in the real life. And what are uh, what's specific about them? Uh, what makes them um, uh, come to you? What are they? What are they? What are their problems, basically? And then we we moving to the to the top left to the box in the top left. What is the problem of those customer segments? Uh, probably the most important thing for me when I'm coaching anybody now is yeah. understanding what is the main problem that they show up with, and then what's the real problem which is underneath that main one. So the main problem for me is lack of sales or leads. That's what they show up with because their business isn't doing as good as they would like it to. Now, the and real problem. Did, uh, before we go to the real problem, how did you get to that very specific problem? Because then when you know that it's it's easier to then um, communicate on that and in order for them to, to, to reach you, how did you find that, uh, that it was their problem? Yeah, again, it was kicking and screaming because I wanted to <laughs> combine a bunch of other problems too. And oh, I can't just define it to one, <laughs> but you, but you must. And I like it. Yeah, it was from a coach. Uh, I had a coach who said, "You aren't picking your, you know, you aren't picking the problem. You're you." And I said, "Well, because they have this problem, that problem, that problem." He goes, "You either choose the problem by next week when we talk, or I'm firing you." <laughs> <laughs> I, this is a true story. And I, I said, you can't fire me. I pay you 1500 a month and blah, blah, blah. And he goes, watch me. You know, so <laughs> he, then, he, then, he, then he hung up on me. And so <laughs> it, it was what I needed at the time. He wasn't like that yep. usually, but it was what I needed. And I sat down and I was mad at, at him and mad and, you know, I'm, but then I chose. And I just yep. said, you know, it's what's the main problem that people have? in a business you know they have yeah. all these other problems but as soon as money is there most of the problems go away you know i got a problem hey let's get somebody to help let's do this when you feel you don't have the money or yeah. you really literally think you know see you don't have the money then you're forced to feel like you have to do everything yourself and yeah. so that's how i de derive that as lead generation or lack of sales and a lot, and a lot of times, it wasn't necessarily lack of leads. It was just lack of proper selling, proper sales technique. Proper sales technique. Cool. So I love it. So you've picked it because your coach told you freaking pick one. Because uh, and again, yeah. it goes back to you know you said be niche in your customer, and then you're like, well, actually now I have to be niche in my problem. And so you told us that's the problem that your customers is aware of. Mm -hmm. But then you told us, but that's not their real problem. So. Uh, if you want to write now their real problem, what is it? Yeah, so this is like these are this will be the gold nugget moment 
uh, yes. from my perspective. So think of what lack of leads or lack of sales creates. If, if I can focus on the sub problems, that's yes. where you connect with the client at their level. When I connect with them at their level, I gain credibility, I gain trust, yeah. and I connect with them in real time, real space. And that's where the possibility of hope begins. And we, when we can combine our logic and our reasoning with hope and possibility, that's when people will make the change. And so- Wow, beautiful. Yeah. Because we're talking about people who's been in business for two to 15 years, right? I mean, they've, they've built, like they dedicated a big chunk of their life in here and they don't see the sales coming through. They, they've got their anxiety that they've got the bills piling up and they've got their spouse asking the question, <laughs> what's happening? So. Boom, lack of confidence. Uh, we use, we have basements here. Do they call them that in Australia? Come in. Basement? Come yes. Basement? Yep. Okay, good. <laughs> so I want to make sure I'm, I'm proper because I know if, uh, I've coached a lot of Australians over the year and I know like you don't check things off, you tick it off, right? <laughs> Let me tick that off. Um, and here in the US, if somebody ticks you off, that means they made you mad. <laughs> and so oh. there's, a, there's some language things. Um, but their it didn't come through. Their belief. Yeah. Uh, their they, belief is in, in the basement. They, you know, they they wonder uh, about making the right decision. Yeah. You know, did I make the right decision? Um, I'm in it so deep now. Is this something that I can really do? And can I change? And they, they just, it's, it's the self doubt. Um, yeah. It's the, uh, let me go here. They feel that it's not letting me, Oh, I just got to click on it. Cool. Yeah. Um, self -doubt. Feeling of what? failure, you know, like they, they made a really bad mistake and they failed. And um, so there's a lot of other things too. They, you know, they, they can't delegate uh, or they feel that they can. It's scarcity. Mm. Um, you know, they, they it's, uh, you know, they uh, call it, you know, delegation um, where they just freeze, you know, and they feel like they, they're, they're kind of like the dog chasing its tail or they're in quicksand. And every time they move, they feel like they go down deeper, you know. I, I love it because you've just described you you know now what your customer think they need and want, right? Which is you know sales and lead to increase revenue. But you know your customer more than they do know themselves because you know that it's more at the mindset level, which is lack of confidence. Um, they they have self doubt. They feel failure, scarcity, uh, delegation freeze. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> yes, I want to own everything. How did you find that out? Was it? Did you have to go through like several customers? Did you have to do uh, interviews? Like, how did you get down to that level to now? Like, you know, we, we're talking twelve years after you started. You started that business. You know exactly uh, the type of problem uh, they have. Yeah. So part of it was living it myself at times, you know, in my yeah. own business. Um, and the other part is I just have this ability to, for me to be fully open. So it's easy for somebody else to open up to me. Yes. Um, that's a gift. I, I, I've worked on it, but it's also a gift that I was given that I use. And so how, how will you call that gift? Um, it, being, being open and being yeah. willing to share what you're thinking or feeling. And as a coach, as you know, Julian, like we have to be willing to put the relationship on the line every single session. Um, yes. And the more that we do that, the, the stronger the connection we have to our clients. Um, I just started a new coach in one area. And one of the questions that he asked me was, how long do you have your clients? And I said, well, I, I average 28 months for a client. What? <laughs> that's what he said. And I go, well, what, you know, and he's, I didn't realize that that's an exception to the rule. Um, I just posted something yesterday on LinkedIn, a client commented 
And his comment was, you know, Jacob's, I've been working with Jacob for four years now and Bob, four <laughs> years straight, uh, five and a half years total and blah, 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 blah. And, and so it's just, um, when you're willing to risk it all, yeah. that means you're totally in integrity. You're totally open. You're totally uh, sharing exactly what comes through us. And as coaches, especially even as entrepreneurs, we get these messages because uh, I don't know if we were alive then, but you know, being an entrepreneur is the most introspective journey I've ever taken. You're forced to make decisions. You have to um, do things that you don't want to do. You have to find ways to motivate yourself. You have to find ways to solve problems. You have to find ways to bring yourself up from the depths of doubt and defeat and all these things. It's a, it's a journey, man. <laughs> and you got to have some, some uh, willingness and commitment, but also a lot of tenacity to come back over and over and over again. And I just think that it humbles us a little bit for those of us that connect to the heart. And that's for me uh, where it's at, you know, the longest journeys from here to here. And once you go to this place, uh, you never want to leave it. You know, so. I love it. So, so for people who are listening on the, on the podcast, it's from the head to the heart, uh, yeah. basically. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I wrote down your, your, your magic weapon, like your unfair advantage, which is like being open and willing to put the relationship on the line. Uh, I, I put a word in your mouth by saying like it's your listening capac capacity as well, right? Because you show people that you're ready to listen. Um, but you go further because you say willing to risk it all as a coach to, with, to, to your customers. I, I love that because it's, it's that, that way that you're building further that, that hope and that, that trust, sorry, not that hope, the trust <laughs> with, with, your, with your client. I love it. And no, so- it is, it is for sure. So, it's, it's, it's a good journey. Um, what's, what is then the solution that you bring to, um, to your customers who's been in business for two to, to 15 years, they generate 300K to 1.2 uh, million on average. Um, what do you, what do you sh give them as, as a solution? Is that, I'm not gonna put a word on your mouth, I'm gonna let you share with us. Well, the first thing is repeatable uh, systems. My spelling, I apologize, my... Uh, oh, good. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, I, I don't look at the, the screen when I type, I'm an old school typer. Right? So, and, uh, what you're doing is the hardest thing because you have people looking at you typing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And so uh, the first thing is repeatable systems, but simple ones. Right? It doesn't to, have to be difficult. And, and is this to address the, uh, the lack of sales or leads or to access the lack of confidence? Uh, it's for everything. It's, it's the thing that sets you free because when you have a system that's repeatable, you can then delegate it. Yes. Um, when you have a system that's repeatable, you get really confident in doing it because anything we do over and over becomes unconscious at some point. Um, it's also something that you can gauge and look at and tweak if needed in certain areas because you can go down each part of the system and find out which part of it doesn't work and then easily tweak it. So they're easily fixable as well uh, yeah. or adjustable. Um, so systems is one. Um, this is a big one. Pricing for profit. 85% um, of existing businesses that I've ever interviewed, whether they work with me or not, yeah. say they're profitable, but when I start getting into the detail, they really don't know what profit they create. I've also had businesses, million dollar companies, uh, chiropractor, 1.2 million a year, realized that the only reason they were doing so well is because they had so many patients coming through. They only averaged $3 per patient after expenses. That's not a profitable business. Wow. I yeah, proved yeah. to him on paper that within three months, if 30% of his business failed to show up regularly within three months, he would implode. And so wow. pricing must have been a wake profits call. important. Yeah. What was that? that? That must have been a wake up call. Uh, yeah. Within three weeks, we changed the pricing. Yeah. He lost 15 patients. That's it. 
yeah. and he became okay. every transaction has to be profitable. There's a percentage that you work from. There's a formula to do it. I teach my clients. Um, I created a program to do it. But I, in my own business, my first business, you know, we had, I told you, we did a million, 1.2 million my first year in business. Uh, halfway through that, I realized on a $3,000 sale, at taking all the risk, my company was making $75. That was it. And I wasn't taking an income yet. I was making $100 a week to pay for my gas, my fuel. Yeah. I like yeah. I like what you're saying. You're saying you were you were your current customers. Like you've experienced that yourself. Of yeah, yeah. look at me, look, I've, it's it's a great growth. I've got 1.2 million in revenue, but you've just pinpointed that it's not revenue; it's profit that matters. <laughs> yeah. Well, in the end, if you, every transaction should be have a the same net profit per transaction, um, minimum. And so if I sell paper clips and I sell trucks, I should have the same percentage of net profit, even if I'm selling just a paper clip, because everything mm. costs money to the business. Most businesses, they won't include their cell phone because they had it before they started, especially startups. They don't include their printing. Who goes and buys the ink? Like you would never go into a corporation and go to the CEO and say, uh, hey, we need ink today. Uh, let me have your charge card. <laughs> So but when you're doing your time, yes. Right? <laughs> so you've you've just shared with us um, like solutions, like so uh, repeatable systems, uh, pricing for profits. Um, oh, messaging to create curiosity. Okay, <laughs> sorry, dig into that one. Yeah. So messaging uh, is another area that costs entrepreneurs a lot of money. If oh. if you change your message every single time you meet somebody new and you think, well, maybe I say this to them instead of what I was just saying to the other person. Mm -hmm. we, we never come across as very confident. Yeah. Um, and if we're not creating curiosity and interest right from the start, yes. then, then we're not conveying a good message. We're probably talking about what we do or ourselves more than required. And just remember, they don't care about us yet. They don't care who we are, what we do. Until we connect with the problem that they have yeah. or the solution that they desire. Those are the only two things that you really have to connect with in your messaging, whether you're talking to them in person, whether it's in con content, whether it's in email, whether it's in video, we focus on three things. It's either problem, pain, or, or gain. If we're not talking that language, we're not talking their language. Yeah. Um, and until you get that messaging correct, you miss a lot of opportunity that you might have. So, so what you're saying is we, we need to be consistent with that message, but we need to test and refine that message until we hit um, the, right, um, well, the right messaging, which, which basically you're telling us we need to understand their pain, their, their pain, their gain, and their problem. Right, which is well, we just put that here on on the business model because you know that um, the pain that is appearing for your customers is the lack of sales or leads. That's what your messaging is going to be about in your business. Is that right? That's the first thing that gets their attention for just a brief second. Yeah. That's it. Because everybody's okay. talking that noise. That's that everybody says. Oh, I'll give you two hundred more leads a week, and you know, increase your things, your sales, and here's a closing thing that you'll close 100% of everybody that you talk to or whatever they say. Everybody's saying that. It's kind of like somebody that's had a weight issue their whole life and saying, hey, I got this great weight program. And they go, eh, I've been through 20 of them. I'm good. <laughs> yes. So that's why the surface problems are so important. Because when I can say, hey, do you ever wake up not knowing what, you, what you're going to do today and wondering if you even made the right choice in starting the business that you have? Yes. Have you and, ever did this? And then all of a sudden they're like, because uh, when you get people saying, do you know me? Like, are you living with me and I don't see you? Um, or they say, wow, the best, you must, you must be doing that too, right? That you know you have the right messaging. <laughs> That's awesome. 
how and so how do you deliver this? Like, is that going to be a, a one on one, uh, or is that going to be in group? Um, is that going to be on the phone? Is that going to be like weekly, fortnightly? How do you deliver? Because you gave those repeatable systems, you get them to work on the pricing for profit, on working on the messaging for, for uh, on the messaging that creates curiosity. But how are you changing that mindset that gives them um, that build their their the confidence and f fixes all the other problem that you listed? How do you how do you do it? Like, what format does it take? Yeah, uh, I do. For mindset, it's two different formats for me. I do group coaching, which is a groups of um, preferably ten to eighteen people in my groups. Okay. Yeah. Um, or I do one on one. Yeah. And it's a in groups. It's a combination of some training. And then what happens in a group, which is a nice dynamic, and I know you've been launching some groups too, is when people express in a group and then you're able to coach them and give them that answer, the question that they ask benefits at least, if there's That's 10 right. people, at least half of the group. Yeah. And then your response gives them empowerment and results and insight and answers as well. So groups are a really nice dynamic, but not everybody is made to be in a group. And so that's mm -hmm. where one-on-one -on -one comes into play as well. Yeah. And how long do you, I mean, you, you said, you know, you've got on average your customers uh, for 20, uh, 28 months. Um, how long does it take um, to change the mindset to get to that point where they have self-confidence? I know that's a loaded question. <laughs> within three months. Wow. If they're willing to do the work within three months. Now, it doesn't mean you're a professional and you can say, I'm good for the rest of my life. It's an ongoing work. I practice every single day um, because there's two of us inside of us. There's good cop, bad cop, or whatever you want to call it. And there's the negative side of us that says, what if, maybe you can't, the doubt, all those things. And then there's this empowerment side, which we all experience at least at moments. Mm. And the work is being able to consciously tap into the good side and you can do it you just have to as i say sometimes you have to slow down sometimes to speed up and if you're just being reactionary to what shows up then you're on the bad side of yourself you know which is the reactionary side and i just react to whatever shows up and life is crazy or i can slow down and choose i can choose how i respond to this problem See, for yes. me, a problem shows up and I get excited and people are like, are you crazy? And then <laughs> I didn't say I like the problem, but I'm excited because if I wasn't moving forward, if I wasn't doing something that's new, I wouldn't experience this problem. How exciting yes. is that? Yes. Right? So now I get to solve it and I don't like experiencing it, but I love solving it because I know I'll, be, I'll never experience it again without being able to solve it. And I can teach some clients. It's a happy day. It's, I love it. It's, it's what you've been uh, saying, like stay on the good side of yourself um, and then be excited with, with the problem because it shows that you're growing and that you're in your zone of, uh, outside your zone of comfort. It, it reminds me of a book, um, um, The Obstacle is Away by Ryan Holiday, which is, you know, mixing entrepreneurship with stoicism, it's, which is, it just comes through in what you're saying. Like it's really... It's a work on ourselves, right? To to stay on that positive side, to 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 see obstacle as the way to progress. Um, and as 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 you were saying, I mean, it's. I think you were sharing this on a post recently, even yesterday. That's one of your four four steps for success, right? You you have to have at least a mentor or a coach at the end, someone who can help you stay on that uh, good side of yourself. Yeah, it. Nothing is meant to be a solo journey. I mean, mm -hmm. even in family, we can't do it on our own. We have to have a partner. Yeah. You know, and then once you have children, you know, you it's you can't have a career and be a solo parent without help. And so it it takes, you know, as they say, it takes a village. It does take a village. You know, people ask me, do I get coached? And I I've been consistently coached since two thousand. But nice. currently, right now, I have two coaches, and I'm about to hire my third because I'm going to get into email marketing because it's such an yeah. important factor of my business. Yeah. Um, and you just figure out how to create the routines 
yeah. and how to schedule your time properly so that you're productive and you get the help that you require. Because if you attempt to do it all on your own, you can do it. People have done it, but you stay small. You really do. I, I like what you're saying. I'm, I'm just adding this in channel yeah. um, uh, e emails. Because you tell, you're telling us you've been in business for 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 twelve years, and uh, you've got you you you've got customers that you keep for 28, 28 months, but you're still like tweaking your channels. You're still improving on some of, of the tools. Uh, that's why you, you you take coaches. You're still revisiting the business all the time. I mean, you told us that. You've got your ideal uh, customer segment, like your persona, your customer profile, but you compare it to <laughs> who is actually coming in. So, it, and and I'm assuming you're doing the same with with their problems. You kind of review their problems. Um, mm -hmm. uh, when when do you do all this? Is that once a year? Is that when do you review your your, your business model, basically? Yeah, I'm. I break it down into thirty day plans because. 30 day yeah. If I'm not reviewing it every 30 days, it's very hard to adjust it and create yeah. success by the end of the year. Uh, I used to be the person who planned and then saw the plan on July 1st, uh, yes. maybe, maybe looked at it until Ju J or January 1st, until January 10th, and then I'd break it out uh, just after Christmas. <laughs> you know, And it's like, oh, I guess I didn't hit that one. No, not that one either. Yeah, I got this one though, you know. And <laughs> it's too much work. Right. And so maybe I, next year, <laughs> you know. So um, but yeah, I break it, I I create 90 day plans and then I break them down into 30 day segments. And so I, I like that. I do quarterly. I'm, 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 that this is resonating with me because uh, I do 90 days at the moment, and but I find that sometimes I lose, I lose traction and focus um, halfway through. So I think I'm going to adapt uh, your strategy of doing it. Um, so like, here's, here's another tip, uh, yep. if I could. So break your 30 day plan into four weeks because see the brain all of a sudden. It, I'll use weight. Uh, if I if I'm going to release uh, 10 pounds in a month or let's say three kilos. And then I, if I break that down into weekly, I go, oh, that's less than, you know, a third of a kilo or a third of a, you know, whatever it is a day in, in metrics. But if I break it into pounds, it's like, oh, that's two and a half pounds a week. Uh, that's less than a half a pound a day. And then the brain all of a sudden says, oh, I can do that. But 10 pounds was a lot. Yeah. So it's just it a mindset shift. Yeah. Love it. Oh man, this is this is this has been beautiful. Like I like using your example of your business to make people realize your entire business can hold on one page, but it's about reviewing your your the, the key elements. Is there one area that um, you wanna you still wanna share with us? Um, like an area that you keep working on because it's it's important for your business and other businesses have the same issue. Yeah, I, I think it's the leadership mindset. And one of the things that I would just say, especially because your audience is mostly startups, right? Yeah. So from day one, approach the business as a business, not as you being good at doing something. So you're an employee of your business and you may be the every employee. I have my clients fill out an organizational chart, a blank one, mm -hmm. and fill in every space. You have your marketing, you have sales, you have fulfillment, you have admin, you have all these things and put your name in it because you're the, you're the solo business. But every time you have a function in marketing, how would you direct that employee? You wouldn't say, Hey, whenever you get to it, Julian, just uh, do that marketing thing. <laughs> you, you would be, here's what you do. Here's when you do it. And here's how we're doing it. And here's how often, and you get on a routine and a schedule. And if that employee doesn't fulfill it, you fire them. Yes. If mentally, if you can just approach everything that you do as an employee and you're directing that employee, it does two things. One, it gets more accomplished. Two, it helps you delegate faster because you become a good manager of yourself first, which you must, and then you can manage others. But if you don't manage yourself very well, you're not going to manage other people until it's too late. You might lose good people. I did that in the beginning. I lost some really good people because I wasn't mm -hmm. a good manager. I had to learn. Um, you said something about listening before. It's a it's a learned skill. I encourage yeah. everybody to learn it.
<sighs> we love talking though. <laughs> yeah, no, I could be a mindset. I could, we could do a whole hour just on mindset piece. Uh, the one thing I would just tell if I'm, if we're getting near the end, it's slow down, be aware of what you're thinking and how you're responding to things that show up and then make a conscious choice how you're going to respond to it. Oh, I caught myself being really angry and tight. That's, is that going to empower me or disempower? It's disempowering. Oh, what would empower me? Let me just calm down. Number one, I'm going to have to get through this problem. Number two, um, is there any upside to this? Yes. Once I get through the problem, I won't have it ever again without having a solution. But just to remember, find the joy in every single step, right? Find the joy that this problem showed up. Because again, as I explained earlier, you wouldn't, if you weren't moving forward, growing forward, as I call it, you wouldn't have a problem. You'd be too conservative. You never take a move. You'll never have a problem. I promise you that. <laughs> I know. Yeah. This is resonating. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Jacob. Um, where can the audience um, follow you and find more of you? Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn every single day. It's as my name, Jacob Roig. Um, also, my website, which is my name, jacobroig.com. Uh, it's being updated as we speak, which is which is uh, needed and required at this point. Um, but still, it's it's people look at it and say, "Oh, that's a really good site." And and then you know, as we critique ourselves, we say, "Well, just wait, because <laughs> it's going to get even better." But LinkedIn is my main platform that I'm on every single day. Uh, feel free to connect with me, ask me a question, anything. Um, if you're a startup, uh, I don't know Julian as a brother, but to me he is. And what I get from him and why we connected is he's a compassionate person who gives everything that he has. And you can't go wrong with someone who shows up fully present and willing to be vulnerable, willing to expose their flaws as well. Um, it's definitely someone that I would strongly encourage you if you're on the fence thinking about it, don't think about it. The money that you spend will show up by the time you're done working with him. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you, Jacob. <laughs> that's, and I think it, sh it goes to show how we met on LinkedIn and how important it is to to be ourselves on that platform um, through through the messaging that that you're sending, um, and as as entrepreneurs, as as a platform to to share who we are. Um, oh, look, thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so one day we will meet. I'll, uh, one of my trips is is coming to your your side of the world as soon as uh, the virus is over and we can get back to whatever normal is at that point. I'd, I'd love that. I've got um, I've got a beach to show you. I've got a few restaurants. <laughs> There's a few places, especially when it's in winter um, uh, in, in in California. It's it's a yep. great summer. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Jacob. I appreciate it, Julian. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody for listening in. And I end the broadcast.